verse 12, our theme verse for this week and last week. Philippians 3, look at verse 12. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. May the Lord's rich blessing be to his word. May it be sanctified in our hearts. Now let's pray together. Shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. It, your word brings light and illumination to us. We pray to speak a good word just today. Lift our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirits. Gives us, give us clarity of thought. Order our footsteps in a way that's pleasing and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I would like to uh, conclude our thoughts this morning from the theme of forgetting the past, embracing the present, and reaching for the future. Forgetting the past, embrace the present, reaching for the future. On any given day, if you turn the television on or the radio or even turn on your computer, you're bombarded by a whole litany of messages of what's wrong in the world, what's wrong in our, in our country, what's wrong with the political system, what's wrong with the economic system, what's wrong with the educational system. And so there is just a constant stream of everything that is wrong. And if we're not careful, it will weigh so heavily upon us that we are unable to see the good hand of God and the good hand of blessing. And it actually takes a tragedy to happen somewhere else to cause us to pause and ask the simple question, well, why didn't it happen here? It could have very well have happened here. As we've watched on CNN and C-SPAN and MSNBC and Fox and the national network news, the reporting about what occurred down in Florida, how a young man apparently having some serious problems packed a nine millimeter in his suitcase, shipped it to the airport in Florida through the whole security system, and then got there, took the gun out of his bag, loaded in three separate clips, and then began to move methodically through the baggage claim area in the airport and just indiscriminately shooting people. And so he asked the question, why not Charleston, West Virginia? Why not Charleston? Why not just send the bag to Charleston, West Virginia, show up at Yeager Airport and do the same thing? It could have happened here. There's nothing. We haven't lived so well for those type of things not to happen here that's happened in other places. And so when we see some of these national and international tragedies, it ought to arrest our attention that God has placed some hedge of protection around us. And we're to thank the Lord for that. It ought to cause us to recognize that even though there are a lot of things happening nationally on the statewide level and local level, we not, might not agree with, we might not think it's uh, consistent with what we believe how things should be done. But this is still the greatest human experiment in the history of this planet this democratic republic that we call the United States of America, and it's still a great place, and we still have the opportunity to pretty much do what we want to do and live the way we want to live for the most part. And if we didn't have a one other privilege, and I've shared it with you on a many occasions, if we didn't have a one privilege that was guaranteed us, and that was the freedom to assemble for religious purposes and to worship privately, that's enough to cause us to thank the Lord and bless the Lord. So as we enter into this new year, I want us to look for the opportunity to celebrate, to see the good hand of God, and to not to bemoan the problems or the things that we have lost, but recognize what we still have. 
What opportunities we have right now to serve God, to represent the Lord, to live out our lives in a robust and in a very bold way, and to make a difference for Jesus Christ. And so this text that we selected from Philippians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul, this great, great man of God, he says, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. It doesn't mean that we suffer from historical amnesia. It doesn't mean that we can erase uh, our memory, but we forget in terms of not dwelling there, whether it was bad or good. We cannot live on a past good reputation. We gotta have a good reputation now. We gotta do some things now to provide a platform for which we speak to try to represent the Christ that we serve and the Christ that we love. And so Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, and we went down a series of things that it would be wise for all of us to try to forget, to let go of those things, to put those things behind us. And we went through a litany of those things from the book of Ephesians that they kind of line out, and I kind of put them in alphabetical order, not necessarily biblical scripture order in which they unfolded in Ephesians chapter 4. But I'll just, for the, for the sake of those who were not here last, we we'll just briefly summarize those because this morning we're going to take a few moments to dwell on those things that we should reach for. But in, Philipp, in, in Ephesians chapter four, 4, Paul lays out some things that we really should forget. He suggests that we should forget anger. We should put anger behind us. Look at uh, Ephesians 4 again and look at the narrative there in uh, verse uh, 26 of Ephesians 4. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So anger is something, he says, we got to be careful to, to really not let it grab hold to us, to not let it seep into our spirit because anger can lead us to bitterness and resentment. Anger can lead us to giving a foothold in our lives to the devil. That's something we should leave behind. In verse 31 and 32, he said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil, speak me, put away from you with all malice. So Paul said these are some things as Christians we should put away from us, put behind us. And I think the turning of the calendar provides us an opportunity to kind of do that inventory in our own lives individually, and to try to deal with the anger, with the bitterness that Paul talks about there, uh, with the wrath, with the clamor and evil speaking. He goes on to talk about the need to rid ourselves of a critical spirit. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And so we, we talk about this importance of trying to build each other up, trying to encourage each other. People need to be encouraged. Most people know what's wrong with them. They're trying to figure out what's right with me. And they need to be affirmed that there is some right about them. There's some good about them. And so Paul said, avoid against a critical spirit. Avoid against being double-tongued. Verse 25, therefore put it away, lying, each one speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. another. This whole idea of, of the evil spirit, which can result from anger and bitterness and resentment. Look at Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The things that grieve the Spirit of God inside of us, so sometimes when we feel really down, maybe, that we're having difficulty really identifying the joy of the Lord, it may be that our attitude is so grieving the Spirit of the Lord that the Spirit of God is being grieved, therefore the Spirit of God is not unleashing the joy in our hearts, our minds, our soul, and our spirit that we need to have him to release to lift us up. The Spirit of God can lift up our spirit even during difficult and hard times. But a lot of it has to do with what our attitude is and where our relationship is with the Lord. He goes on to say, not only anger and bitterness and critical spirit, double tongue is evil spirit, fault fine in verse 31. Those things need to be put behind us. Guilt needs to be put behind us. Us wallowing in self-pity and in guilt it doesn't make things any better. <laughs> it doesn't make us any better. What makes us better is to recognize that Jesus Christ has dealt with our guilt and our shame when he shed his cross, his blood on the cross of Calvary. And we receive the Lord's forgiveness. And we stand in that forgiveness and we remember what the Lord says through the Apostle Paul that there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And so guilt can be a ploy that the devil will use against us in and through other people. Other people will try to manipulate us to make us feel guilty and to feel shame so they can control us. And what we need to do is to stand in the freedom and the liberation that we have in Jesus Christ. Not having to defend, but to say anything that someone could say about me is not merely as bad as what I could say about myself. Anything that someone could say about me probably is not nearly as bad as something I know about myself. So if God has forgiven me of the things that I know about myself, which may be worse than the things that you know about me, then I don't have to be held hostage, and you don't have to be held hostage by someone else's opinion about you that will cause you to feel guilt or shame. There's nothing therapeutic about guilt. The only thing therapeutic about guilt is that it leads you to repentance. If guilt leads you to repentance, then guilt has done all that guilt can do for you. To lead you to repentance, to lead you to Jesus Christ where you can receive the Lord's forgiveness. These things need to be put behind us. The fault finding, the age raising need to be put behind us. Worrying. Immorality. Look at Ephesians 3, uh, and Ephesians 5. Therefore be followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell and aroma. But sexual sins and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So Paul is saying there are some things that we individually have to grab a hold to and decide we're going to put it behind us. And we're not going to bring that baggage with us forward. We receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and by faith say, Lord, I want to move forward. I want to walk forward in Jesus' name. Are you following me? Well, I don't have a lot of time this morning, but uh, I do want to spend the next few minutes talk about the things that we should reach for. There's some things that we should be reaching for, that we should be pressing for, and that's what Paul admonishes us to do in Ephesians 3, uh, 12 and 13. And some of these things we can see right here in this, in this text. Look at what Paul says, some things that we should reach for. Back up in the, in the chapter 4, of Ephesians. He said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to have, to have a walk worthy of the call in which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the peace in the bond of, of the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and God and our Father of all, who is above all and through all. And so Paul is admonishing us to reach for the worthy walk. We have a position in Jesus Christ, and Paul is saying reach for that position that you have in Christ. Reach for the potential that you have in Christ. Don't be satisfied with where we currently are, but believe, believe by faith and by the power of God we can live better. We can do better. And one of the tendencies we have as we get older, we have a tendency to kind of settle. This is the way I am. Well, God doesn't want us to settle for the way we are. He wants us to constantly be pressing and, and reaching to try to do better and try to live better in a life that is more pleasing and more acceptable uh, to the Lord. Amen? Paul also wants us, admonishes us that we should, we should reach for forgiveness. In verse 32, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because it's so packed with admonition as to how God wants us to live. On the heels of saying, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you, Paul says, and be kind to one another, right? Be kind to one another. Someone wrote a piece some years ago, everything I learned to be successful in life, I learned in kindergarten, right? And so one of the things that they're trying to teach kids in kindergarten is how to be kind to one another. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, 
And I think that the prerequisite to forgiveness is kindness and tenderheartedness. Because tenderheartedness comes from you having your heart injured. We develop a tender heart when our hearts have been injured. And rather than us becoming bitter and allowing shellac to cover all that up, we maintain a tenderness of heart so we know that things hurt us. And so since we think know that things hurt us, we know that those same type things can hurt other people. That's what it means to be tenderhearted. To be tenderhearted is to recognize there have been dots that has pierced my heart and that brought me tremendous pain and meant and tremendous hurt. And what I don't want to do is to bring that same type of pain and hurt into some, um, um, someone else's life, and that's a tenderhearted person. And out of being tenderhearted, there comes like a kindness of not wanting to afflict pain or hurt, but want to administer grace and be a spiritual salve that brings some comfort and that brings some healing because everybody has been wounded and everybody has deep hurt and so everyone can uh, benefit from a heavy dose of kindness and tenderheartedness. So Paul said we should be reaching for kindness, reaching for a tenderheartedness that gives us the capacity to be able to forgive just as God in Christ has also forgave you. The reason the church really has to be a church, the church, is because our society is designed to be an adversarial society. The very nature of a democratic republic, where there's a two-party or three-party system, is to divide people around political ideologies, right? So by definition, the society is being, being put in a position to divide itself along certain, certain lines. There needs to be one institution that's trying to be the healing agent, the bond of bringing people together so that everyone recognizing the common humanity that they have, the common needs that they have, the common hurt and the grief that is there. That's why the church has to maintain its strident independence and not be held hostage by any political party. It has to be the continuation of the life of Christ. It's trying to bring healing. It's trying to bring forgiveness. It's trying to be an agent to bring about reconciliation. So our country right now is divided, literally. It is divided probably as much as it's been divided since the Civil War in terms of dividing along the political fracture and political ideology. And so there's a need for the church to say, but we're still the United States of America. We're still one people, and we say we're indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice for all. We've got to figure out how to find common ground. And the way we find common ground is being able to forgive each other. <laughs> it's being able to forgive each other. And if we really want to see God bless this nation, both the Democrats and the Republicans who say they're Christians, the Democrats and the Republicans and the Independents who say they're Christians all need to fall down on their knees and confess to the Lord the things they did and things that they said against the opponents during the political process that was damaging, that was hurtful. And so there's still tremendous harsh feelings, and you listen to the people talk on television, and no one will say, well, what, we, we shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Nobody will say that. No one will say, we, we shouldn't have done that. So we're just stuck. We're just stuck in this malaise, and we can't even agree that it's not a good thing that the Russians try to hack our process. We can't agree on nothing because we're just stuck because of the inability to forgive. We can disagree, but we can still forgive each other by each acknowledging what I did and what I said was wrong and asking for forgiveness. And that's a start toward being able to be reconciled to try to find common ground. The hope for the United States of America is the Church of Jesus Christ. There has to be some independent broker that's independently trying to lift up what's the truth and what's right and what's fair and what's just and trying to move people to come together to seek the common good. The common good doesn't mean we all get the same thing. The common good doesn't mean that we all have the same uh, opportunity. The common good means we're trying to find the common good. And how do we hold our nation together so that it is indeed, it, it, there's a coherence to it, and so that our children will grow up to love it, and they'll want to go off to fight to defend it if necessary. 
That should be a concern that, we're always ha that we always have. It's what message are we sending to the next generation? Will they embrace a love for the nation, a love for its freedom, a love for its constitution, so much so that they're willing to take up arms when and if necessary to defend it? You don't want to live in a nation where people don't believe that it's worth defending and protecting and trying to hold together, even with all of its flaws and all of its faults. It's still the best experiment. And that's why the church needs to be the church in the United States of America today. And you don't hear it. You don't even hear it. the church saying, let's try to bring people together. I'm talking about you listen nationally. That, you know, you know, that conversation is not even being had. How do we bring people together? How do we try to get people to work together? How do we work through some of these tough and thorny issues in a way that is fair and it demonstrate we're trying to do what's right and what's best? We got to reach for tenderheartedness. We got to reach for forgiveness. A few other things, and I'll, I'll stop this morning. Paul goes on to say that there is a need for us to reach for other things. Look down at verse 8. He said, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. There's still something noble about reaching for what's good. Trying to do good things, trying to do good works. Trying to let our light so shine that people will see our good works and glorify our God that is in heaven. These are things that the church has to reach for. Paul says, so we reach for goodness, we reach for righteousness, we reach for truth, because these things are noble. If you were to flip over to Galatians chapter 5, you, you see some of these same themes are captured as Paul wrote to the church at Galatia. Because people were the same in different parts. They were dealing with some different issues, but they had the same basic challenges. And so some of the same words Paul uh, repeats to the different churches. Look what he says in verse 22 of Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's something we got to reach for. How do we reach for love? How do we reach for looking and being willing to sacrifice ourselves to advance the best interest for others? We reach for the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, Faith, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And so Paul is, is calling for the church to reach for the noble, reach for the fruit of the Spirit, reach for those, those ideal things, those things that are, may appear sometime to be nebulous, but the things that are consistent with the character of Jesus Christ. Because what is needed more than anything in the world is an ex authentic expression of what it means to be a Christian, an authentic expression of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ where we as Christians, we become the continuation of the life of Christ and where people really believe that Jesus Christ is active and moving in and through the church because of the conduct of the people who say that they're Christians. And so we reach for these things. We reach for love. We reach for joy. We reach for peace. We reach for faithfulness. We reach for goodness. We reach for gentleness and meekness. We reach for temperance. And in all that reaching, we also need to reach for courage. We, really, we need to reach for courage. It requires courage to try to live out our faith. It requires a, a depth of Christian character to live out our faith. It requires a certain conviction to believe that we want to do what's right simply because it's right. Not because it's convenient. Not because it's easy. But it takes that, that Christian courage, that Christian character, and the Christian conviction to try to do those things that are right simply because it's right. And we're not trying to get the latest press clipping. We want to be right in eternity. 
We want to hear Jesus Christ say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Faithful over a few things. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. And so as we move into this new year of 2017, another gift that God has given to us, allow, allowing us to see the candle, the calendar turn over one more time. I pray by the grace of God we come to the end of this thing in December 31st, 2017, we'll all be here. But that's not a given. Because as I shared with you last week, most of us in this sanctuary this morning, we have more Christmases behind us than we got in front of us. You know, my mama used to measure her life by Christmases. <laughs> so she would always say, depending on someone's age, well, he has seen a many Christmas. She has seen a many Christmas. And so most of us have witnessed more Christmases and experienced more Christmases in our past than we have in front of us. So it's now time for us to seize what we got left to seize what we have left to make a statement about the love that we have for God and the love that we have for the things that God loves and our desire to see Jesus Christ's name lifted up and our desire to see people saved and people's lives changed and see people having joy in the Lord and see people giving testimony of how great and how good God is. I shared with the men yesterday, we were having a great conversation, and one of the things I was sharing, I said, you know, sometimes you can't give people what they want. Sometimes you can't give them what they want. You got to give them what they need, what they really and truly need. And what people need in society today, they need to hear a word from the Lord. They need to know that God still speaks, that God still speaks as he spoke in the past, that God is still speaking through his word, and God has a word for their life to order their footstep in God's word. God still has a word to speak to them through the confusion that they might have in their mind to help them bring, gain some clarity to understand how they should live their lives. That's what people need. People need to know that they matter, that they count, that they have value, and that other people believe that they are important. So they need the fellowship of the saints. They need to hear people expressing their love for them and showing their love for, to them. They need to hear people calling their name out in prayer and calling out the name of their children and their family members to know that I do not bear these burdens alone. There's someone else that bear these burdens along with me. That's what gives us a sense of significance because we are valued by other people. You can sit there and watch the TV all you want. Nobody on that TV are going to come to that screen and put their arms around you and hug you. No one is going to whisper words in your ear that you need to hear. We need the human interaction that has been anointed by the power of God. And so what would ordinarily be just a human conversation, because it is divinely inspired, people need to know that they still can encounter God. And every now and then, when people have been around us, they should have a sense that God was in that place, and I didn't even know it. And that's what the church has to strive for and the church has to reach for the, every time we come together. Pray before you get here. Pray while you're coming. Pray when you're going in the door because what we want is for God to fill this place with his heaviness and with his presence. So when people come in here, they sense that there's something in here that is not ordinary. It is extraordinary. It's not human, but it's divine. That's what we got to reach for. That's what we got to strive for. If God does not show up in here, if God is not going to come, if God is not going to run the heavens and come down, then what we ought to do is put a sign outside the building, Grace Restaurants, open up a restaurant, start selling fried chicken, start selling barbecue, start selling chillings, whatever bring people to come. Because if God is not in here, then we're wasting our time. But he's not going to be here unless we call on him unless we ask him to come, unless we invite him in to be in here with us. And that's what we should want more than anything else. And that is what people need. They need to encounter God. They can listen to Dr. Phil every day. And once Dr. Phil is finished, they're no better off than what they were before they started listening to him. He can get some good words of wisdom, but Dr. Phil cannot empower them by the Holy Spirit. Somebody can tell me what to do. I know what to do. I don't have the power to do it. That's why I need some help, Brother Linwood. I know I shouldn't have ate all that candy that Sister uh, Easter bought me from down in Louisiana, but I just like it. My wife, she tried to help me. She put it out so the kids could eat some of it. Otherwise, I would hide it and eat it myself. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I just need some help in getting it done. 
We need the help of the Holy Spirit to get it done. And that's what the church is. It becomes a house of prayer. It becomes a place where people come to know that God is still real and they feel God's presence in a greater intensity than when they can feel him by himself. Yeah, you can worship God by yourself. Yeah, you can serve God by yourself. But Jesus did not say that the hates, gates of hell weren't going to prevail against you as an individual Christian. The gates of hell can prevail against you as an individual Christian. It can prevail against me as an individual Christian. But the gates of hell cannot prevail against the authority of the church. It cannot prevail against the authority of the church. And that's what Jesus said. And so we got to keep fighting. We got to keep fighting for these young people. They don't even know how bad they need God. They don't know how bad they need the church. They don't know they need to be in the fellowship of the church. And every time somebody come and criticize the church, and I hear people criticizing the church, I just ask one question. When your grandmama got sick, where did you have her funeral? When your cousin got shot and killed, who did you call? And who showed up? And who even cared? Why is it that you don't want the church, but when you need the church, you're not too proud to come and ask for the church's help? And you're not too proud to eat the church's kitchen or, or chicken, not too proud to sit at the church in the church's dining hall when you need the church. And we're not mad at you. We just want you to understand you need the Lord, but you also need the Lord's church because the Lord's church represents the Lord in this dispensation. And so we keep putting up. People can say what they want to say. I love the church. I believe in the church. It's America's only hope. It's West Virginia's only hope. It's Kanawha County's only hope. It's Charleston's only hope. It's the only hope of change. It's the church. And I love, I love thy church, oh God. Don't ever despise the church and don't ever despise the influence of the Grace Bible Church, though small in number. Our name has echoed out from this west side of Charleston. It reverberates all around the state of West Virginia. People know about the Grace Bible Church and they know we mean business when it comes to serving God. They know we, come, we mean business when it comes to serving God. That we hold our convictions, but we hold our convictions in love. We believe what we believe because we think that's what the Bible teaches. So we believe what we believe about marriage and the family, not because we just made it up. It's because what the Bible says. We believe what the Bible says to be true, and that's what we're trying to lift up. While we love everybody, whether they agree with us or not, but we're not going to change what we believe the Bible teaches to gain your acceptance. That's not the way it works. The church is the only hope. The only hope to save this nation from sliding into a third world nation category. We're held by a fragile thread. It's the effectual fervent prayer of the people of God. And I still believe that if God was willing to save the, the sinful, immoral nation of Sodom and Gomorrah, if he's willing to save that whole nation, if he could have found 10 righteous people, I believe that God will save the United States of America for us if necessary. If we call out to him, and keep trusting him and lifting up his name and never be ashamed of him. So this is our challenge. This is our charge. This is our opportunity. And so I encourage you all. I challenge you all. Reach out to people you know in your neighborhood. Reach out to people you know in your job. Reach out to people where you go and ride the bicycles with and do the exercise with and do the Zumbas with and do all those other things you do. All those things you do with all those people. And then you go back and eat all that food. But it, it, the Lord knows. At least you try. Tell her about the Lord. Here's, here's, here's our last thing. We're we going to celebrate everything. In 2017, the Grace Bible Church, we're going to celebrate everything. So one of the things we're going to do is at least one Wednesday out of a month, we're going to have the biggest potluck meal you could possibly find. That'll draw some of y'all out. We get them pots and pans stuck around in the kitchen. We can have this, this, just a potluck on Wednesday and they ask everybody, invite your people you work with on your job. Invite some people you encounter the other day. Tell them to come and, and have a meal with you. And we just come down and have a meal together and then come in and, 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 and sing and lift up our names to the Lord and have a brief time in the word of the Lord together and then go home and see if God will move in the heart of some of the people we invite. We want them to experience the grace awakening. We want them to experience being in God's presence when we lift our voices together in prayer to sense the warm, the warmth, and the nurture of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. If God ain't in it, y'all, I don't want to be a part of it. Right? If God is not in it, I don't want to be a part of it. So if God moves his presence, 
over on Central Avenue to the park place, I'm going to go and join the park place. Wherever the Lord is, is where I want to be. I want him to be here with us. And I believe we pray, we ask him to manifest himself, and we come with expectant hearts every Sunday and every Wednesday. I believe God will honor our request, and he'll manifest himself. We need to encounter God. Don't you know you don't just need to hear the choir, that ain't enough? And you certainly don't just need to hear me. You need to encounter God. That's what changes your perspective. That's what energizes you. That's what lifts your spirit. And it gives you the tenacity and determination to go on because something supernaturally has got a hold of you. So when you come to church, it's like plugging in your iPhone or your, you know, your, your bars get low. You can plug that thing in. People walk around carrying batteries now. They can't live without these iPhones. They got to charge this thing up. They might miss some tweet. They might miss something. They got to have them. They just got to have them, right? Well, the Holy Spirit is everywhere. He can charge you up. Amen? Well, I'm way out of my time. I thank you for yours. God is good all the time. And he's worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. Let everything that have breath give praise unto the Lord. Amen? And if you get, if we get where we can't praise God, if we get where we get too educated and too sophisticated to where we can't praise him, may he cause our tongue to cleave to the top of our mouths. And may we not be able to articulate one single word until we decide, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises will continually be in my mouth. So make a joyful noise to the Lord on the count of three. I want everybody to say hallelujah. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Our breast is holy name. Hey, my name. Let's all stand together and bow for prayer, shall we? Maybe some